I see this war on self-deprecation. I see this war on anxiety. That's the, all I hear about is I have anxiety. I got to get rid of anxiety. Anxiety is great. It is why our species has proliferated. Anxiety is information. It tells us what situations to get out of. It tells us what people are not healthy for us. It's our gut, you know, and I know there's anxiety disorders and I've struggled with it, but it usually is information telling me do less of this thing, cut this person out of your life, you know, and I think anxiety is important. So is adrenaline, so is cortisol. I think that we're leaving neurology out of a lot of these conversations and we're leaving sort of a evolutionary biology mm -hmm. uh, element out of a lot of these conversations. So a lot of the things that made humans so successful, we're now trying to right. get rid of. I'm not pro-anxiety, but right. I do think that anxiety is our gut sometimes telling us information we need to know. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatest podcast. We've got the inspiring and hilarious Whitney Cummings in the house. I'm Thank super you. pumped you're here. Thanks for having me. I watched your, your movie on a plane like eight months ago. Yeah. Female Brain. Yeah. And it showed a different Did side none of the of other movies load or what was happening? <laughs> what was you having? She's already got it. She's like, zing. <laughs> zing. I'm just curious. Uh, no, because I wanted to learn more about you. Oh. I think I, I saw you at whatever, a comedy store or comedy. Which one oh, is Oh, really? It? Comedy store? Yeah, okay. I saw you there probably a year ago. Mm -hmm. I've only been there maybe four times in seven years since I've been in there. Oh, wow. Maybe four or five times. Mm -hmm. And I went there and you were performing and I was dying. Laughing. Really? You were so talented. A year ago, I must have maybe been working on new material. Maybe a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty rough. So I was probably... <laughs> 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 yes. it was like, like, that seems like when I was just starting yeah. this new hour and it was probably only premises. No, it was amazing. Oh, thank you. It was you. amazing. And um, I was in the balcony watching you. I actually tweeted you afterwards, not that you saw it, but I was just like, Sorry. wow, I really admire the way you work the room, the way you tell amazing stories. And I think you were even saying, I'm working on new materials, so like, yeah. work with me here. Yeah, yeah. But you weren't, you weren't allowing any of it to show that you were insecure in any way, which I think you were talking beforehand that a lot of com comedians are yeah. always insecure. Yeah, which is what drives us, and you know, I didn't, I know that we're all on this quest to solve insecurity and make it all go away, but insecurity sometimes drives us to do yeah. good things and get better and work harder, you know? So I think insecurity can be good fuel sometimes. It's not good if you're just, that's your default state. That's, you know, something to, to work on. But, um, but yeah, I definitely, you know, it took me a long time to embrace the fact that in stand up you succeed by failing oh. over and over again. It's like going to the gym. You're not always going to have, the killer day that you want to put on Instagram. You Standing know? ovation, no, laughing no, out of their mind, no. snorting, yeah, like, milk. Most people just see, you know, the it's like a sculpture. You Most people just see when it's done in the museum, right? You don't see the chiseling yeah. and the messing up and the fixing and the repasting and the whack-a-mole. You know, that's stand-up sure. when you come and see comedians, like, you know, cobbling together. You're going to see comedians at every level sort of figuring it out. I have no desire to be a comedian, but I feel like it'd be the most incredible training for my personal growth. I think like everyone should stand up, do right? it once, even once. Just you to fail miserably and you, get laughed at <laughs> in a bad way. Right? I think you wouldn't. I think that you're so authentic and you know who you are in, in that's that's the key to it, I think. Yeah. It's just, it's not about saying the thing that's the funniest, it's saying the thing that's the truest and that matches people's perception of you the most. You'll find out right away how people perceive you, which is kind of an interesting exercise. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What was the time that you realized, okay, I'm actually not that bad? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there's probably a period of, or were you just always funny and it always, people laughed and clapped and cheered? I mean, I, no. I mean, it, it's tricky because then you think you're great and then you have a bad couple months and then you think you suck and then you, you know, have nothing to lose, so all of a sudden you're great one night just because you don't give you a don't crap anymore. anymore. Yeah, and then you go, oh, whoa, it was the trying too hard that was repellent to people. And, you know, so as soon as you stop giving a crap because you think you suck, sometimes that's when you do your best work. Uh -huh. So I think that I've never got that right. There's a dysmorphia involved in it. So you, you know? still need to prepare and care about your material, mm -hmm. but not care what people think about you. 
in a way, point. yeah, you have to care a ton, and then as soon as you get on stage, you can't care at all. Really? You know, it's like this switch you have to turn on and off, but it's also, you can do the same set, same jokes, same way, two nights, one time you get a standing ovation, the next night you just really? bomb. Why is depending that? Depending on your energy, depending on how in the moment you are. You know, I think that I took some boxing classes a couple of years ago, and I couldn't believe how much like stand-up it was. If you're a second ahead or you're a second behind, the joke's not gonna land. Like you just have to be like listening. It's a conversation with the audience. You know, a joke that worked the night before might not work tonight. You just can't go into autopilot. Really? You can't. You just have to be right there. You gotta feel the energy. Yeah. Every city is different. Every venue is different. Every group of people is different. There's a bachelorette party in the corner. You know, the, weed's legal in California. It's different pacing in LA right. now. You know, it's just kind of being flexible and detaching from your plan and detaching from the rote memorization or detaching from this worked 50 times so I'm just going to do the same thing I've done. It's just being willing to detach from all the things that worked for the past year Wow. and being flexible, I think. And did you always want to be in comedy, you know, in school growing up? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I knew that's what I was meant to do. I was, you know, I hit a couple different um, walls that I thought like I thought I was gonna be a, a journalist really? you know because I was like a seeker and I was curious and I was critical and I always wanted to uh, you know get the dirt like we're comics were kind of snitches at heart right really? you know we're complainy snitches <laughs> that are obsessed with justice and I thought oh. I was gonna be like an Upton Sinclair where I was gonna like go into factories and reveal the you know we're obsessed with that stuff we're obsessed with secrets and lies and injustices oh. and then um, I was also a performer, and I was also like doing theater and like plays. Like dance, singing, D plays. No dancing, no singing, as a strong boundary. Uh, <laughs> how dare you? Um, no, not like a theater kid. I was doing like very serious plays. Like I was Shakespeare. Very, like like um, A Doll's House, like okay. Ibsen's A Doll's House, which was sort of about this woman and a wow. bad relationship. You know, so I kind of was like, and then when I was hanging out with my friends, I would tell these really long, boring stories about how I like, hated how you can't find your car in a parking lot and I don't like the ticketing system. Uh -huh. And it was like, st I didn't realize what I was doing with stand-up. I didn't realize... Those are the conversations that do the best on stand-up. Totally. And I, I was just sort of like, oh, I have a huge complaint and I want to talk about uh -huh. it for 40 minutes. This isn't a date. <laughs> this isn't what you right, do right, on right. dates. This is what you do on perform in front of an this audience. This is what you do in front of an you know, audience. Or your girlfriends. I, or... I totally, I was dancing around it. Wow. You know, I was dancing around it. And then someone one day, and I think just to get me to shut up, um, was like, you should try stand up. Like, You're it pretty was funny, the way of yeah. saying, like, get this out of here. There's a couple of moments. I'm not obsessed with comedians, like studying it all and going to all the shows and mm -hmm. watching everything, but I enjoy it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's fun for me. I'll watch different stuff when it's on Netflix or I'll go to the comedy store once a year yeah. type of thing. But I remember, I don't know if you're friends with him, Dane Cook had mm -hmm. a, like a CD special like 15 years yeah. ago that Does he told a called? joke that was still in my mind. Yeah. There's something like you talking about the parking ticket system. Whatever it was, yeah. And he was talking about when you're in a parking garage and your tires like squeal. Mm -hmm. And for some reason this joke like stayed with me. Yeah. It's nothing crazy funny or some out of the, the world It just resonated experience. with you and you felt connected and I think that's what stand-ups yeah. do is like, you put a bunch of strangers in a room and they all agree on something. They all connect That's on something. Dif they vote differently. They are, you know, have different interests in movies and women and men. Who mm -hmm. knows? Different all. races, different experience, backgrounds. All coming but they agree on different something. Different socioeconomics get together and go, the wheels squealing in the park. We all have that universal experience. It's oh. finding the things that we can all kind of agree on. And um, I think that always interested me. You know, I grew up in a home that was not harmonious, where there was a lot of discord, a lot of disagreement, and I always kind of wanted to get everyone to agree and laugh. And Interesting. It was, it was always like to try to um, sort of just manage tension. It was always like, if I can make this person laugh, maybe Christmas will be fun. You know, like it was always kind of just trying to manage people. And then, you know, as an adult, it's almost like a herding dog. You know, when you see a herding dog, a shepherd that wants to get everyone in one place, I just sort of have this instinct of trying to go like, we actually have more in common than we don't. Um, yeah. is something that it's just like a instinct that I don't know if you can teach. You know, are you, I think are you, a, are you a younger sibling? I'm the youngest. Yeah, the, youngest of yeah, the peacemaker. Always, yes. 
How I mean, we've got some illegitimate ones floating around, right. but three that we know <laughs> But you of. know, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm the youngest of four. For some reason, I just knew that you had an older sibling yeah. based on the way you were talking there. Always. The youngest of three. Mm -hmm. um, what was the biggest discourse within the family? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I mean, it was, this is not, you know, I have no victim stuff about it or right. um, regret about it. You know, uh, you know, there's just the divorce and alcoholism mm -hmm. and a lot of mental illness in my house growing yeah, yeah. up. A lot of, you know, we're very lucky. We're at a generation that has podcasts like yours and some books like this. Tools to learn we from. Did, my parents didn't have those tools. Yeah, it was passive aggressive communication. It was everything's fine, everything's fine, then a huge explosion of resentment. There was mm -hmm. no like, um, you know, talking about that. I also grew up with a mother that I'm really proud that I had, but she was the kind of first generation of women that was balancing full-time career and kids. That's... So she was under a tremendous amount of stress and didn't have child care and was just always so stressed out yeah. and exhausted. Yeah. And, but taught me, you know, she was up at 6 a.m. and she was home at, you know, 7 p.m. and she brought me to work with her, but I just saw her trying to manage everything and, um, you know, it was always like, how do I just make things easier for everybody else? Yeah. And the joke kind of, to me, was like a magic trick. It was like, whoa, that was easy. That was an easy way to get love. That yeah. was an easy way to cut some tension. Yeah. So I learned early on Gosh. how to kind of tap dance. We all did. You know, yeah. I think we all grew up in, you know, we're the first generation that isn't turning to you know, alcohol and anger and rage Drugs, and, and yeah. some kind of just quick dopamine hit. Or we're, we're doing other dopamine hits, which is like meditation, working out eight hours of sleep, mm -hmm. eating healthy. A false sense of control. It's <laughs> exactly. our new addiction. It's yeah. trying to yeah. optimize certain things that we can yeah. to, to ease the Maybe overcorrecting yeah, exactly. in, in a way. This is crazy because... Self-help-ism yeah, exactly. is kind of the new ism. It's crazy because we we're very similar based on what you're telling me. You know, so. my parents were passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. There was no love or affection, mm -hmm. zero. It was like they forced the love to try to mm -hmm. show it. They should have been divorced before I was, was even Was there born. shame around getting a divorce or? Yeah, they, they stayed people. together because of yeah. us, right? Mm -hmm. Not, it wasn't because they loved each other. Mm -hmm. Maybe they loved each other in some sense, but mm -hmm. they were both working full-time jobs to pay for all four of his kids. Yeah. And like my mom, you know, she was working full-time and then trying to take care of us. Yep. It's, yep. it's almost like they went crazy in a yeah. sense. And you're watching overwhelm, you know, you're watching... Stress, overwhelm, screaming, fighting, you know, mm -hmm. constantly r leaving the house yeah. and uncertainty. That's right. Inconsistency, and like, stormy. Uh, and it's also, I think, you know, as a kid, because you don't understand um, the emotional one plus one equals two, so you're just trying whatever you can. Yeah. And the same thing you're punished for one day, you're rewarded for the next day. It's like, to me, I never understood what added up. So it was like... Be funny, be loud, tap dance, come out yeah. and say, you know, so I, I was always sort of experimenting with, with what worked. But I grew up in, in, and I, you know, wrote a book about um, codependence, which is something that is kind of a word we use to describe mm -hmm. like relationships where you spend a lot of time together, which is not really what, co it can be codependence, but I didn't understand um, that I grew up in a, you know, alcoholic home, yeah. um, but also a very codependent home, which where people did a lot of things out of obligation. To people please to feel, yeah. And which is very, it's part of like tradition, I think, in our culture. I won't speak for other cultures, but it is, you yeah. know, you go to church on Sunday, you have to do this, you have to go to this bridal shower, you have to bring in gifts, you have to go to this housewarming. There was a lot of um, uh, sort of love uh, that I now realize was obligation, yeah. socializing that was obligation. We have to go to Christmas, and so many people were divorced that it was like going to nine people's houses oh for Christmas. Gosh. And I didn't really learn do what you want to do that makes you feel, it just force yourself to do things, white knuckle through things, you do things out of and obligation. And be resentful the whole That's time. That's right, and codependence breeds resentment, so I'm just gonna be miserable, and socializing is joyless. Like, I, I really had to work hard to make socializing joyful later, because wow. I just didn't have a concept that it wasn't work. It's interesting, I, you know, I felt very similar, and when I was 13, I begged my parents to send me away because I just didn't want to be in the environment anymore. Wow. So this is why I went to St. Louis. I went to a private boarding it's school. Wild. I've met some kids that were just more positive. Mm -hmm. I was like, I want to be around these group yeah. of kids who are thinking differently, who yeah. are, just feel like they're yeah. in better environments, better family uh, environments, and I begged them for a whole summer yeah. to send me to the school, seven hours away from wow. Ohio where I was living. and. Um, it sounded like you tried to escape as well. 
Yeah, I didn't ask to be sent away. <laughs> it wasn't as civilized. You just, you just left when civilized. you were 18, Yeah, I kind of right? got sent. I had. Oh, you, you did? Know, yeah, I got sort of sent to Virginia. Oh, wait, how old were you? Because I was acting out. I was 12. Shut yeah, up! I, know. We have I was a, 13. We have a similar thing. That's Holy a trip. cow. Yeah. So you got sent away. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got sent away because there was, you know, various family drama. Oh my hardcore. Gosh. Yeah. And it was like my parents kind of just, it was too much for them. So I went and I lived right. with my aunts uh, oh, in Virginia for a while. an hour and a half, two a hours far. away? Or? Yeah, a little more. Like four hours away. Four hours away. Wow. You know? For yeah. how long? Uh, about three years. So mm-hmm. you went to... Uh, Middle school, high school for mm-hmm. a little bit in Virginia, away yeah. from your parents. You see, see them in I'll summer, see them on Christmas, weekends, or anyway. yeah, you know. And I think that was okay. It was. It's interesting, you know. We're so, it's, you know, and and I have all sorts of scars around that, and you know, uh, character building um, moments, you know. But I think we're. It's so maybe it's American, maybe it's I don't know. You guys will correct me in the comments, I'm sure, um, but. It's just so odd to me that we're like raised by two people and that's it. You know, it's like we're kind of designed to be raised by many different people. That's right. And, you know, as odd as it felt for my parents to go like, we can't take care of you. We're leaving you here. Like at the time, my brain was like, you're not good enough. You failed. You're unlovable. Like all those narratives that, of course, my psyche was going to write because my psyche, you know, I. I know this is a common thing, but I'll speak for myself, is that when our parents fail, that's too much for us to yeah. handle. So we have to blame ourselves. So that was a really big part of, you know, the way I developed. But looking back, I'm like, I feel really lucky that I got to be exposed to so many different yeah. kinds of parents and caretakers and their flaws and their strengths. And, you know, I grew up in D.C. and then I grew up in Virginia for a while. So oh, I got wow. to kind of get like... You know, and I think that's part of what makes me a good comedian is I'm not just in this like elitist blue state. You know, I got to all I got to see how people live that aren't in a metropolitan area and see the value of that and learn community and connect with animals. And so I I feel really lucky that I got to have a little bit of both. And you went went back when you were 15, 16. And then I went back to D.C. when I was 15, 16. They welcomed. They were less exhausted. I think so. Yeah. I I, I, your siblings were probably older. They were in college now. And so. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it was, it's, there's, there's some, you know, some scrapes, like it was, you know, it was not ideal, but I, yeah. I don't know where, like, we get off as people expecting our parents to have any idea what they're doing. No. I mean, when you look around and look at your friends that get, have kids, you're like, they're having kids? Like, why? why? Like, you look at your friends and you're like, oh my gosh, like, my parents, none of, no one was ready for kids. No one. My it parents just, had my brother when they were 19, they're like, in school. He, I they don't, don't know, know who I, they are. I just feel like, for the most part, I mean, look, a lot of really tricky things happened to me as a kid. I have a lot of trauma. I'm the, the whole thing, and I do EMDR, and I'm in 12-step yeah. programs. And I, yeah, yeah. you know, I, a lot of people, I think, know about all the things I do to fix what happened. But for the most part, like, I think we have incredibly high expectations for our yeah, parents that do. are just too high. If you study history or you study the um, timeline of, sort of what we know about neurology and yeah. psychology, it's yeah. only in the last 20 years that anyone stood a chance. And when we can learn to forgive and mm-hmm. accept and have compassion for our parents, that's when we can really heal those relationships and heal ourselves, mm-hmm. from not beating ourselves up or feeling like we're less than or not good enough or not lovable. Yeah, and it really was like they did the best they could. And that's I it. don't, I, I truly don't think my parents were like, how are we going to mess up Whitney today? Like they were literally just trying to keep their head above water mm-hmm. and given the tools that they had. And but, but it and sounds I, like if you had a perfect life, you want to be where you're at. Yeah. The adversity is what makes you stronger. It's what makes you more creative and what makes you able to like break out of your comfort zone and mm-hmm. try things probably. And it just is what it is. There's nothing I can do about yeah, it. Yeah. You know? So I just, I think we spend so much time in blame yeah. and that is just like it to me, I have such a, uh, economy of energy brain I just say do you have spending any time being mad at someone that you know I, I, I just just don't do it and I love what uh-huh. you said about forgiveness because I, I remind myself on a daily basis like we forgive others not because they deserve forgiveness but we because deserve. we deserve peace and that's that, it it's not about them no I'm not saying it's okay what forgiveness they did. is selfish you know, it is for it's your just, inner peace. It's just taking things out of your backpack. Yeah. It's just like, why am I carrying this around? You I know? Like yeah, my mom is has enough shame about what happened. Like, I don't have to right, be right. mad on top of it. It's just not, it just doesn't. Guilt her until she dies. It just doesn't yeah. work, you know? So I think if it worked, I'd do it. But it just doesn't. <laughs> Blame doesn't work. You're not more connected and more loving with each other. I don't get a check every time I get mad at my mom. 
It just doesn't pay any bills. <laughs> Man, I'd be rich. I do totally. I just don't. <laughs> I'd be rich, right? <laughs> see the point, you know? And I, you know, you might know this about me, but I learn a lot about myself and about um, sort of the error in the ideas I have um, by training animals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even when I have the best intentions, I make mistakes and I screw up and I, you know, and I just, it makes me have so much more compassion mm -hmm. for my parents. I love watching your videos of you with your horses. How many horses do you have? I have one. one I only horse. have okay, one, so but one horse. yeah. Um, it seems like there's many because it's... Yeah, I know. I work with many, horse. but yeah, I, yeah. I only... And um, I think there was one a couple weeks ago of you walking away and it was just like your energy. She's like, look, she's going to walk or he or she. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, now if my energy's bad, she's going to back <laughs> off. <you> know, <laughs> so like... It really, you know, I think... I spent so much time, I wasted my 20s really, and nothing's waste, but I, I really did, was unconscious in my 20s because mm. I was trying so hard to control other people and trying so hard, you wow. know, my subconscious brain was working so hard to figure out ways to make myself feel safe and to avoid abandonment and avoid rejection and avoid criticism. And as a result, you know, I just, I realized, and, and equine therapy is really the only thing that helped me understand it, besides Al-Anon and 12-step programs uh -huh. and codependence recovery, how desperate energy is repellent. And the so repellent. And the more badly we want something, when we push something, we push it away. When you have two desperate people, that you can come together and be like, away and together, away together. That's very codependent, right? Yeah. Two desperate people. That's right. And just sort of like the unhooking. Oh, and man. the only way to win is to not play yeah. and to don't just do something, alone, sit there. Because yeah. to me, my drug is taking an action. My drug is, and it becomes this sort of, the tighter you pull something, the knot just gets tighter and tighter. And that really is what I think about when I think of my 20s. It was just me trying so hard to be loved and respected and, and heard and seen wow. that... I was like, it's just, it's annoying. It's, it's, it's repellent is the, you know, I think best way to put it. And, uh -huh. you know, working with prey animals really helps you understand. It really holds up a mirror to your energy and what you're giving off and what is needy energy. And um, mm. so my horses really helps me with that. What are you most proud of about yourself that you've done in the last 10 years from your transition to 20s to 30s oh, wow. looking back? That's a really good uh, question. And I have a couple, you know, this, um, uh, I have a couple. Like there's the financial things I'm proud of, mm -hmm. like owning a home yeah. and having a 401k and, and just being sort of- independent, yeah. The basic self-care of that. You know, I grew up poor, like the, I just having health insurance is a big deal. So right, I think right. times where I'm like, I didn't get this and I don't have this many things and I don't have this much money. I'm just like, the fact that I have health insurance is, is yeah, a miracle with what I come from. I think we yeah. forget our basic gratitude lists or basic, if you had told me 15 years ago that I would have a 401k, I would think you were you know, on LSD. So <laughs> I think it's important to also have you know, gratitude and about those little things. Um, but for me, I, I would say it's, um, it's so simple for me handling a conflict with grace is like mm. the biggest achievement I can make at this wow. point because you know achieving things and getting things and winning things and selling shows or making specials that's all you know I know how to do that but to me the biggest challenges are sometimes just being able to shut my mouth for 20 minutes and listen to someone who's wrong wow that to me is 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 the one of the biggest accomplishments listen to someone who's wrong and not try to make them right or not try to fix it and just go like just that sounds be. hard and not try to change someone's neurology in a conversation not coach them or give them a solution no nope. i'm sorry you feel that way not try to be like a guy essentially right yeah. <laughs> how dare you no, I'm just kidding. how dare you imply that i talk about the differences between men and women um that to me is that's what's been the hardest thing for me wow is to be able to be in a relationship with someone working relationship romantic relationship and not try to control their behavior opinions neurology and to be able to tolerate um the discomfort of others and other people being wrong it, wrong is subjective so what is that even so the hardest thing for me is you know becoming a boss and having employees and just going they're not doing that the way I would do it, and mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to accept it. And I'm not going to spend the next hour obsessing over how I would have done it and micromanaging the person. It's just that kind of taking the hooks out wow. for me has been a big one. Being able to tolerate the it's discomfort of others, the flaws of others, that's yeah. my biggest thing. It's interesting you say that because in the beginning, before we started recording, you said uh -oh. something about um, 
how you don't, how we shouldn't love ourselves in like a cheeky way. You were like, yeah. we shouldn't just be all love yourself or who you are because then you're not going to work to improve yourself. Is that right? Yeah, and I don't, I was driving over here and I was like, God, I hope I'm a good fit for this show <laughs> because I am so like, you know, I see all this self-help stuff on Instagram and I just am like, I don't like generalizations. My brain just doesn't do well with them. Like yeah. black and white, love yourself. Like yeah. I see this war on self-deprecation. I see this war on anxiety. That's mm -hmm. the, all I hear about is I have anxiety. I got to get rid of anxiety. Anxiety is great. It is why our species has proliferated. Anxiety is information. It tells us what situations to get out of. It tells us what people are not healthy for us. It tells us it's 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 our gut, you know. Yeah. And I know there's anxiety disorders, and I've struggled with it. But it usually is information yeah. telling me do less of this thing, cut this person out of your life, you know. And I think anxiety is important. So is adrenaline. So is cortisol. I think that we're leaving neurology out of a lot of these conversations, and we're leaving sort of a evolutionary biology mm -hmm. uh, element out of a lot of these conversations. So a lot of the things that made humans so successful, we're now trying to right. get rid of. And, you know, we have such a big problem with people self-medicating in our country. And I think a lot of it is like, well, we got to get rid of our anxiety. It's like no human is allowed to be uncomfortable ever, Stressed ever, yeah. ever, you know? And so, you know, I just, I, I don't, I'm not pro anxiety, but right. I do think that anxiety is our gut sometimes telling us information we need to know. Yeah. I think if you look at it as intuition, like if you're starting to feel anxious about a moment or stressed or, or like something's off yep. and you feel anxious, mm -hmm. okay, you don't need to hold on to that for 30 days yep. or for three years. Yep. Like you, you shouldn't stay in that space, yep. Yep. but listen to it and figure out a way to adjust in your, something in your life, right? Yeah, it's just there's, there's. I think that we tend to pick and choose the pain and discomfort that we want, mm -hmm. you know? You don't go to the gym and go like, oh, this hurts, I'm not doing it. Like you go, no, this is like gonna, I don't know anything about exercise. Make me grow, look it's, better. I'm gonna yeah. tear the muscle and get stronger, you know? And I think for me, um, I just, you know, this whole like love yourself. Like I wrote a book on loving yourself and overcoming codependence and building self-esteem, mm -hmm. but that term to me doesn't honor neurology and how self-esteem or the frontal lobe works. And it also is just like, love yourself if you did something. Mm. What are the esteemable actions? You know, if you yeah. want high self-esteem, you have to engage in esteemable actions. This idea of like everyone just deserves to love themselves all the time. Like, I don't know. I mean, some people. Are... I think you should. I think it's like there's something to be uh, accepting yourself for where you're at and how mm -hmm. far you've come. Yes. And say, okay, I accept and love for where I'm mm -hmm. at right now. Yes. But I also know there's more available for me. I think for and me, I need an engine. I need. Yeah. I. I. Complacent sitting around all day. Yeah. I just for me, it's not possible to just go. Oh, I love myself out of nowhere. That's just not how <laughs> nature or nurture works. So I yeah. think for me, I I'm really into achievable goals. But I do think there's this sort of generation of people that maybe love themselves too much and haven't <laughs> like you know. So and that's maybe my comedian brain yeah, yeah. kicking in. Sure. And I think that there's self acceptance. There's self love. I think. You know, I just, you know, my, I just, and this is just, yeah, probably me trying to make a joke about it, but a lot of the people that I see saying, like, I'm going to love myself today, I'm like, aren't you the same person that just tweeted something nasty about it? You know, I'm just like, why would you love yourself? That You know, mm -hmm. so I think that we just need to, I think self-love coupled with self-awareness is important. This radical, I'm perfect the way I am all the time. I don't think so. Look I think, at our environment. Look at yeah. our world catching on fire. Like we might love ourselves too yeah. much. And I think we build more confidence by the actions that we That's we right. take. That's right. And it's by being our word consistently, whether it be in a relationship or right. if you say you're gonna work out five days a week mm -hmm. and actually following through mm -hmm. to your commitments. I think that's what makes you feel like, okay, I love myself. Like yeah. I'm like appreciate myself more for the yeah. actions that I took and for being a good human being. Yeah. You know, and I guess for me, what I the and I don't think I'm being clear. Like my problem with love yourself is like I try not to set goals that are so unachievable and vague that I then feel disappointed that I I couldn't. So when I go, I'm gonna love myself in five minutes. It's just like that's not fair. I'm yeah. setting myself up to fail. I'm trying to change 36 years of neurology <laughs> and God knows how many thousands of years of epigenetic imprinting. I'm trying to overcome it because mm. of a tw like an Instagram meme I saw right, that right, said right. love yourself. You know, it just feels like a shortcut yeah. that is not attainable and I'm just going to be more disappointed in myself when I can't achieve it mm. right away. So I like to take like 
bite-sized pieces of goals so that I don't, um, you know, a big thing we do in, you know, 12 step programs is you, you know, in order to honor your word, you only set boundaries you can actually follow through with and you uh. don't make threats or so if you and I are in a relationship and you're on your phone while we're talking, I'm like, if you ever do that again, I'm gone. You and can't it's threaten like, this. Nope. Yeah. You cannot threaten something that you can't follow through with that's not attainable because then, of course, you're going to check your phone again. And then well, you're leaving and then, I, and then I'm not going to leave because it's the, I just set an, made an impossible threat mm-hmm. that's, that I can't follow through with. And then I'm gonna, it's going to start to erode my self-esteem yeah. because my word means nothing. Right. You know, and you can't take me seriously and I can't take me seriously and then I don't respect myself. And it, so I, I just and try to... And then you to, resent everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you do this in many relationships, yes. it sounds like? I don't know what you're talking about. No. I, I've heard that people do, you, do this. Do you struggle in your current relationship? Because you're engaged, right? I am engaged. And I'm really lucky. I, you know, by the time we started dating, I had been in a 12-step program for almost eight years. I've been doing EMDR for about four. I've been hearing EMDR is amazing, I hear. It's a, a game changer. People, yeah. It's a game changer. Again, like, I'm not a, this is the panacea that's going to mm-hmm. fix everyone. Right. If you have, you, you know. Lots of tools. Yes. You know, try different things, yeah. And I had also been in a 12-step program for whatever, five years by the time I got to EMDR. So I think I had the tools to even receive what it was. <laughs> yeah. I'm also a big fan of the placebo effect. Yeah. It's an effect that works, whether it's psychosomatic, whether it's scientific. I don't care. It works. I was in a place where I could really receive it and I was ready mm-hmm. to change. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's no point in doing it if you're not ready to change or if you don't buy it or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, but it was at a time where I was really ready to release my character defects and put down all the weapons that I needed when I was a kid because I was carrying around a lot of armor and a lot of weapons that worked great. A lot of masks. When I was younger. Yes. I had a mask on a mat. I was the, you know, and, um, and I was just ready. I was ready to stop fighting. It was like something we say in, you know, Al-Anon is, um, the war is over. You lost. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, you know. Surrender. Yeah, totally. And we're like running around on a battlefield of a war we lost with our guns and our harpoons and our, our cannon. And it's like, no, we're not. And the war is meaningless. It's, it's like a meaningless war. It's been over for war. 20 years and you're running around like a maniac, yeah. you know. Um, Isn't it interesting until we kill ourselves, we can't become something greater. Like we have to kill our old self, yeah. kill our ego. It's such a shame because. Shed off these things, right? Because I, you know, I think in something that I talk about, you know, in codependent recovery stuff it's like like you know the person that grew up in the home that you know that's a superhero that's a you know Mm -hmm. I think we tend to look at our character defects as failures in some way or as you know that weirdo that psycho I was crazy it's like no I was like perfectly equipped to fight that emotional war I was Mm -hmm. perfectly equipped to deal with you know mental illness and addiction and codependence and rage and whatever I just like don't need to be the Hulk anymore. No. You know? It's it's exhausting. It's exhausting and it's just not useful or smart and it's an energy drain. And it's like, um, I'm just, it's the funhouse mirror. It's just my perception. I just need to sort of update the software is what I call it, you know? Yeah. Is that things have changed and my brain stayed the same. Wow. So it's just really acclimating to my new circumstances. So how is this new relationship that you've been, I guess you've been in for a few years now, Mm -hmm. but how is this your partner now with all the work you've done how do you feel like, it's what's your rating? Well, I think for what's me. What's your grade card? <laughs> you know, if you're like a D in other relationships, are you like a B plus, an A minus? No. Or are you like a gold star every day type it took, of girl? Oh, God. I give myself a B minus, oh, I would say. a lot say. of room to improve. Mm-hmm, a lot of room to improve. But hey, I was a C student, so it's better it's, than me. It's not so bad. I mean, I also am a perfectionist, so I'm sure other, yeah. my version of a B minus is probably other person, is it another an a person's minus? A minus, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like check for inflation. You know, I am I feel grateful. You know, I also took this sort of course on how to kind of change the type of person you're attracted to because mm. I'm sort of obsessed with Harville Hendricks and how we're attracted to people who have the negative qualities of our primary caretakers. So, <laughs> isn't that crazy? <laughs> crazy. So I kept recreating my childhood circumstances. So did I until recently, over yeah. and over and dating my dad and dating oh, my mom and dating oh my, my siblings and, da- and it was just like incest. At a certain point, you got to stop dating your dad, guys. And it would just trigger me. And you know, I had to do a lot of. I even did a lot of sort of like body trauma work because, yeah. you know, our bodies Gosh, react before body our keeps brains. Score. Totally, my favorite. So we are the same person. This is alarming. Um, so <laughs> You're I just would, much funnier than me. 
<laughs> as soon as I, not at 9 a.m., um, but as soon as I would get into a defensive, I was gone. It was like I would just go offline and I would just turn into this robot who was mm. just, and so um, I found myself being attracted to people that I had to take care of, people that were a mess, people that were chaotic, and it was just adrenaline, and you know, and I'm also identify as an addict, so adrenaline turns into dopamine, so you know, dramatic, rush, dramatic situations are addictive. They are. Dramatic people are drama addictive. Drama is addictive. Correct. Correct. Stress. Yes. Drama. And being a victim is addictive. So being addictive. in a relationship where you're like, well, he doesn't do this and he doesn't do this, it makes you it's feel... It's your responsibility. It makes you feel interesting. It makes yeah. you feel bonded to other people. Complaining is addictive. You know, and I was in all of these really hectic relationships, mm. secret relationships and cheating and... Mm. Dr and you know, it, you always feel like you're in your own action movie and you feel important and this, mm. um, you know, so I found myself on that hamster wheel for a long time and I was addicted to addicts and um, sick people and malignant mm. narcissists was my drug for quite a while. Right. Um, you know, so we call them Christmas trees. Like you, you know, when you have not recovered your brain and the type of thing that you're attracted to, you can walk into a room and it's just like, the most messed up person will just light up. It's mm. the only person that's like, wow. This is my person. I'm gonna rescue them. They're gonna make me feel more important. They're gonna need me. Mm -hmm. We call it passion. We call it chemistry. Yeah, yeah. We call it butterflies. When that's really just your body saying, "Stay <laughs> no, away from on. this person." Anxiety. It's anxiety. <laughs> it's helpful. We go. Oh, screw that anxiety. No, screw the person. Yeah. <laughs> it's making you. Well, don't. But you know. I mean, it's, it's a really a reflection of us, though. Mm -hmm. You know. Totally. We attract what we are. Vibrate. We, we just yeah. vibrate on a different frequency so it might be a different it. level of messed up that we are mm -hmm. so I'm I it took me a long time to realize like chemistry is a red flag if I vibe with somebody turn around mm. get in your car and just leave the party but you should still vibe with the person you're with you in should a get way. along but if it's like <laughs> <laughs> something right. else is going on right, for right. me personally right, right, you know right. I found that if you like enmesh with someone right away and you're like we spent five days together straight like that is for me, addictive, and I kept getting into these addictive, entrenched things where you fall in love before you Quick. know the person, yeah. you know? And so it took me a long time, you know, because I kept being these relationships with unrecovered mm. codependents, unrecovered addicts, unrecovered, you know, narcissists, and, you know, as if that's something you can really recover from. And, you know, my brain labeled it as chemistry, passion, soulmate, all these sort of things that we tend to romanticize. Wow. And it took me, understanding neurology to really realize I was just kind of a puppet of this dopamine oxytocin cycle. Wow. You know, so that was really helpful for me. Learning neurology, I think, is the, the biggest game changer. And when you said, like, what are you proud of? I think for me, that's, that's the biggest one, to be mm. able to just honor neurology and not make everything so romantic or personal mm. or cinematic. It's like, oh, that was just oxytocin. Right, right. They're not your soulmate. That's all that was. It's sure. okay. You know, so for me, it was really, I had to write lists and I wrote about it in my book, like lists of, you know, what I wanted, what was, um, would be nice. It was like a list my therapist mm -hmm. made me do. Yeah. It was like, you know, dream, li dream list requirements oh, with someone, which is like requirements, like not yeah. budget, not negotiable, this. not negotiable. This my bottom I mean. lines, yeah, yeah. this is what I must have. This would be nice uh -huh. and red flags right. and the red flags were like not negotiable. Yeah. You know, so that I really had to they figure out. They can't be an addict. They can't be whatever it is. Yeah. Correct. Married. You know. <laughs> <laughs> on my space. Things like that. They can't be married right now. Hard yeah. and fast rules. You know, <laughs> because I think that the problem with chemistry clouds our frontal lobe. Right, you know, right. dopamine crowds our judgment. You yeah. know, clouds our judgment. And so for me, I had to get really oh. self-aware about my judgment. Yes, no list. So it's clear. Yeah, yeah. I had to really treat it like a business proposal and wow. for as non-romantic as that sounds, yeah. you know, because I found that I found that my relationships were draining me and depleting me instead of energizing me. And that wow. that's a bottom line for me. So yeah, no stripper poles, no stripper poles. Yeah. No, thank you. I'm good. And I, uh, you know, it's something my, my therapist said something to me that was really interesting. Um, and she's, you know, she basically went, your relationship needs to be boring. And I, wow. I was like, no way, what do you mean? They have to be exciting and dress. You're this. gonna bring the excitement though. It told, she was You've like, got action and, she, and energy. She, what she made me realize is what's boring to you is really just serenity. 
peace. That's right. Because <laughs> you don't have peace in any That's relationship. Right. That's right. And you need to have peace when you go home. That's right. Your home should be a sanctuary and you should, I love that Flaubert quote, which is like, you know, isn't it be boring in your personal life so you can be brave and violent in your Ooh, professional life and take risks. Ooh, and a lot of the most successful people, at least in my field, are the ones that are like, have been married for 35 years, you know, Will Ferrell and yeah. Steve Carell and all these guys where they're not out dating, you know, it's a time suck. So it's much a full-time energy. job. It's so much energy. And I realized I was chasing people whose love I couldn't get, that I could never get because of this addiction to, I think rejection and abandonment and this addiction to auditioning for approval. So I would be like- Auditioning for approval, as you said? Mm -hmm. oh. I'd be magnetically attracted to people whose approval I could like never, never get. Did, like your dad. Like or my dad. Whoever, yeah. Or a malignant narcissist who just can't. Wow. You know, or I would need too much from somebody who couldn't give. You know, I was just really, um, constantly in those relationships, and I was in relationships where I would do 80, they would do 20, because to me, like my workaholism, like that was just my comfort zone. Make it work, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I really, it took me a long time to get out of that. So to answer your question, it's it's kind of a, a vic triumph, really, wow. a victorious triumph that I'm in a relationship that's healthy and peaceful, peaceful, and you know. Just, wow. He's just useful and calls me out on my shit and sets boundaries. Wow, and that's good. I he can, stands up for himself. Too. Yeah. He's oh, not yeah. just letting you walk all over him or whatever. No. He's and like, I can be authentic with him. And, you know, it's really like, you know, the things that we, and he has the tools to have these conversations, which is really helpful. You know, I think you have to date someone yeah. that has a similar toolbox than you. It's emotionally intelligent, yeah. Or else what are you doing? That's and true. if he doesn't, it's like he's able to say, you know, express that he's not, and so am I. You know, and we're really... You know, and I also, I, I, this was something that I think was really helpful in this relationship. I didn't throw all my crap at him right away. I used That's to good. think that my trauma was the only thing that was interesting about me. And no, your heart is interesting. Really? Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. But I didn't sort of give it all at once. You mm. know, it was, it started long distance, which I think was really helpful for an addictive brain because it was able to pace. You can't spend 24 seven for Two weeks with them. It's not sustainable. Obsess over like every little detail. No, don't do it. It's I'm in long distance right now, and actually, it's amazing because I miss her. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, I wish she was here. But I'm also like, wait, let's wait, let's give her more time. Let's like really enjoy the process. Like we're communicating on the phone. We're not mm -hmm. obsessing over certain no. things. No. Yep. She's independent. I'm independent. We're building like a foundation. I feel really... It's really, I mean, this is just such a basic thing and we didn't, I didn't, um, learn basic things like this when neither. I was a kid. Get to know someone. <laughs> Don't just fall in love like Don't. this. Don't, yeah. just get to know, it's very simple, oh, yeah. you know? I mean, this is, um, you know, for me, I was just so sloppy about it and I think for me, again, like I, my biggest fear in life is being boring, mm. believe it or not. And so my thing was like, here's all my trauma and here's all the terrible things that happened to me and here's my, you know, all my, and it just, it how makes, interesting and complex I it am. It gives you this false sense of emotional progress with the other person, this false sense of intimacy that's just not real and you're in this house of cards. So for mm. me, it was really about kind of doling out my personal information with him. I mean, wow. in a way that was, was organic, healthy. Yeah, it was organic. And it wasn't like, I'm gonna show all my victim so then now you're attracted to a victim and now we're in this unhealthy thing, no, wow. you know? Powerful. So it was really important to me to sort of curate and still be authentic, but mm -hmm. kind of just curate and be boundaried about what I shared with him when, because What's I was trauma bonding with people and wasting six months at a time. What's the thing you love about him the most? Oh, wow. Um, it's a different type of podcast. He, I know. I love this. <laughs> this is these are questions that nobody ever asks me. That's good. I love it. The thing that I love about him the most is you know, and I think this is so obvious. Maybe um, he really is endeared by a lot of my. For I don't I don't like when people call themselves crazy, and I and mm. I don't I tend not I try not to do it to myself. Yeah. I'm really careful Be about careful about your words. I'm so careful. To become what you say. My idiosyncrasies. Mm. He's he's entertained. Corking it. Yeah. 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 Cool. And he understands, you know, recovery and he's very like you know, he's like, I'm gonna stay in my lane. He doesn't try to control me, he doesn't try to fix me. That's amazing. My thing is I have enough notes for myself, I don't need more notes. Mm -hmm. I wanna hear your feedback and I wanna improve, but he's not um you know, he's entertained by it. Yeah. Which I think is important. You need someone that um is kind of your fan, you know? and isn't disappointed like when you um, do something. Um, I, he's just, 
he doesn't take personally my behavior. Mm -hmm. How about that? He doesn't. It's not like everything I do it is affect him. Yeah, if I don't text him back, he's just like, "What happened?" He's not yeah, like, yeah. "Where have you?" Been? He's just very like, "Did you lose <laughs> your phone again?" I mean, he's just like he's not kind insecure, of, jealous. No, yeah, yeah. he's just exactly. He's very just he kind of endeared yeah. by you know. I have five every day. I come home with a new dog or a pig or a horse. Like he's just, chickens. He's a very patient man. Like, okay, yeah. He's a very patient man, That's and I, I need that. I uh, interviewed a friend of mine named Devon Franklin. Do you mm -hmm. know who that is? That's familiar. He's um, produced different movies, written books. Uh -huh. I don't know if I have one of those books up here. His wife's Megan, Megan Good. Is that her name? Megan Good. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's like a pastor, a speaker. All, oh, that's really cool. inspiring. And I said, uh, he wrote a book called The Wait, where he waited to have sex with his, with his wife until mm -hmm. they were married, right? Mm -hmm. And he talks about relationships. And I said... And I went through a breakup at the end of last year, and I interviewed him afterwards, and I go, when do you know you found the right partner? Uh -huh. Maybe not like your soulmate, but like yeah. the, the one who can be the one. Yeah. And he, without hesitation, said, when you feel at peace. Yeah. And I never thought about that before. So simple. But you just mentioned this, how it's like peace at home, so you can be chaotic and take risk in the world. You I know? can't walk into my house and get, like, I mean, he, I can say to him, I mean, I feel really lucky that I can go, I don't have a lot to give this week. Wow. I can say that. I don't have a lot to give today. You know, you need someone who is able to get their internal needs met without you. Have their own friendships, have yeah. their own life, get their own, derive their own value from their job or their work or family mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And he also, I think for me, you're never gonna find the perfect, that's not a thing. It's like, are you with someone who's willing to course correct? Yeah. Are you willing to be with someone uh, are you with someone who's willing to grow for you if that's so what you need? So for me, there was like, you know, a couple things like when we met, you know, I was like, this doesn't work for me. Is that something you're willing to change or not? And if you're not, I just got to go. Mm. We're not going to, you know, it's figuring out what your bottom lines are and seeing how flexible the other person is. So this, yeah. is this is the first time I entered a relationship like as a business deal. Wow. You know, like, okay, here's are the things I need. Here are the things that don't work. Are those? Are you willing to change those? If not, I gotta go. How no many, love lost. How many things did he have to change? <laughs> I'm talking about twenty things. I'm like, dang, this guy's. I had to change some things too. Right, right. And so they he made me better. Non, he had some non-negotiables. He was like, all right, you're. We made each other better. Mm. I think you know. And there's some things I'm like, that's not gonna change. I don't have time to change that. Yeah, yeah, this is who I am. I just, this, I don't hate, I don't, you know, so it's really like a, it's a negotiation. It's a dance. It's yeah. emotional negotiation. It's like what's tolerable. But I think to me the thing that is the most valuable is that we can be in the same space and not be talking or touching each other. You know, that to me is a big deal because I used to think that intimacy was about proximity. Always like touching, Always. talking, like and my, silent, something's wrong. My horse taught me that. You can coexist with somebody and not be so close that you're going to put each other in danger all the time. Wow. You know, so there's this thing I love that we say in program is that if you are holding a handful of sand, if you hold it like this, mm -hmm. you can hold it forever. But if you hold it like this, you're going to lose it. You know, so the goal is to always hold it like this. Mm. Anything. They can, it can leave when it wants. It can, That's know. it. I love you, keep going, you know, is our thing. You know, I love you, keep going, go do your other thing, go have your, do that, you know, because this is just, you never want to be here, you want to be here. Mm -hmm. So that's not. I was thinking about being here, like moving like up together, side by side. Well, that's right, right? Dressing, yeah, This yeah. is the like other thing. Forward or up, yeah. People have to, I mean, I didn't learn this as a kid. Right. This is your. They didn't teach us in schools, right? Your listeners are like, we, like, maybe this is so obvious, but something that, you know, someone explained to me, this neurologist, she was like, if two trains are going like this, they can go forever. But as soon as you're here. You crash. Yeah. And you can crash in relationships. You're just so, him and I can coexist in the same room. I can be on my phone. He can be reading a book. We're not, what are you doing? What? It's not, him having a life is not a rejection. Mm. And me having a life and ambitions is not a rejection to him mm. personally. And I'd only been in relationships where me going on a trip, he has to come. And me, you know, if you're going to, I have to come with you. You know, this, this sort of, um, Interdependence, not codependence. Yeah. Wow. Was something it took me a really long time to learn. Who was uh, more influential for you growing up, mom or dad? God, that's such a good question. God damn it, you're asking such good questions. I think it was probably my dad. I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Um, probably my. My, in influential in different ways. Sure. You know, um, but yeah, maybe my dad. What was the biggest lesson he taught you? Uh, Whether through actually him yeah. saying a lesson or just example or what he didn't do or. Yeah, um, that 
you know, he said something to me that I love that I, I I I didn't understand how good his advice was until he passed. Like I didn't mm. I didn't you know because I I had this narrative that I had a crappy dad, I had a crappy mom, and that's all we focus on, you know. And then you do a little work on yourself, and you're like, okay, there were some major gems in there. He used to always say. <laughs> ask other people questions, mm. they just want to talk about themselves. Mm. And I never, it took me so long to take that advice because I thought when you meet someone, you have to entertain them and you have to impress them. And you have to show them all the things that you know. It didn't occur to me like, no, just ask the person about themselves. That's how you connect with somebody. Like I thought every time I met someone, I had to perform for them. Mm. You know, and I just thought that that was the arrangement and it took me a long time. Um, to understand that the easiest way to connect with someone is to just ask them questions about themselves. I know that sounds so obvious, mm -hmm. but it's such a life hack and it's such a great way to me now in business to find out who I'm dealing with. Because right. I like to decide who somebody is and then when they don't match how I've cast them, I get confused. Mm. I don't accept, I don't, I'm not interested in who you are. I'm interested in who I think you are and then you disappointing me. Like, it's just like the most backwards. <laughs> right. I like made an assumption about you and then you didn't match my assumption. Right. Instead of actually just doing the field work and finding out who somebody is and if, it, if it's a good match, you yeah. know? And um, that was really helpful for me. And he also gave me some really good advice where he said, be careful with how independent you come off because it doesn't occur to other people to help you or give you any kind of emotional support. Because what I would do is I'm strong woman. I'm, I'm fine. My, I got I'm this. independent. I'm fine. And da da da. And I'm like, why isn't anyone helping me? <laughs> like, why are we doing everything alone? It's like it would never occur to anyone. So it, just asking for help was a really big deal for me for a really wow. long time. Just saying, can I get some help with this? And it not being a shamey, gross. I owe you. You owe me. Now I'm keeping score. Because in my household, asking for help or an involving an adult in a problem came with guilt or shame or you're needy or you're you know something yeah, there yeah. was just too much of an emotional aftermath you're not good enough to do it on your own or smart enough totally. or whatever yeah totally wow totally so just mm. little things like that that probably you know but he also my dad was gone a lot you know and i i definitely have been defined by the absence of a dad when i was a kid you know and it took me a really long time to not decide all men <clears throat> were that way or to not let it mm. frame the way that i saw the world how did the relationship end for you when he passed? Um, with my dad? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was, you know... Would, Were you in a good place, do you feel like? or was No, it... not really. I yeah. mean, it, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I think that's, that death is such a defining part, you know, it's interesting because, and I don't know if anyone wants to hear about death, but all the things that I'd been working on for so long kind of click into place you know, when a death happens, you know, like working so hard on boundaries, working so hard on saying no, working so hard at reducing the amount of things on my plate, working so hard to not do things out of obligation. You know, I've spent so much time doing that. And as soon as I lost my dad, it was like, I'm not doing that. No, nope, I'm not going on a hike with that person. Wow. It just, everything becomes so clear what's important and what's not. So wow. it's interesting. Isn't it sad that it needs something like that to happen for us to yes. course correct our life? Or just me. It could be me and what it's I needed, a lot of people, though. Yeah. you know, and you know, I think that, and I don't know how that tool is helpful. Don't kill your dad <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to emotionally make the progress you need. But, you know, it was something that was a little bit like, you know, his passing kind of was just a really big part of, mm. you know, things, you know, clicking into place. And in a weird way, I think it's the gift he would have wanted to give me in a weird way and, it, mm. and he had a stroke both my parents had strokes which is a big part of why I got so into neurology and had to understand it really quick because yeah. I was all of a sudden in ERs looking at brain scans and people talking about the prefrontal cortex like, and I'm like on? I have no idea what that means and finding out what part of the brain you know affects what and um, and so I think that like ultimately he gave me this incredible gift that you know in a Wow. As a side effect of something kind of tragic. Yeah, wow. You know? Yeah, when did he pass? Uh, about a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, almost two years ago. And it was interesting because, you know, you really find out who the people are around you when someone in your life passes because mm. grief makes you boring and makes you unable to give anything. Wow. And you really find out the kind of people that can show up and tolerate you grieving really calls out your circle. <laughs> Because right. it's you're being like, the fun one, the entertaining one, or the 
like, are you still my friend if I'm just staring at the wall like a zombie crying for six days? Like, am I still someone that you want to be friend? You know, be around. So that was every the tectonic plates really shift in your mm. in your life when something like that happens. And I had just started dating the person I'm with, and the way he handled it, wow. I think, is really what made me understand. Um, what great partnership is and what he handled everything like he just wow. went into handle it mode and I was like okay so I feel grateful that I think yeah. it's like the the very it's a lot of the damage that you know uh, you know my dad I feel like I got from him him passing at the time that I had started dating Miles gave Miles the opportunity to step up and show me who wow. he was and kind of it was it was kind of kismet it was sort of this weird divine thing I was able to sort of him passing is how Miles was able so to step up. Passing and the torch. I was able now. to kind of undo the cycle, kind of thing wow. through it. It was pretty surreal. Do you feel like you got to say everything you wanted to say to him? No, and that's okay. You feel at peace about everything, or you wish you would have? I'm so not this person, but I'm gonna be this person. Uh, I did do ayahuasca a couple months after he passed, like six months, because the grief was just, I didn't know what to do with it. Strong, yeah. Yeah, and I think that because I'm such a keep moving to get out of your feelings anyway, I really didn't want to run from it and mm -hmm. for the grief to manifest in other ways. Yeah. Other ways. Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't want that energy to come out in like the workaholism or the codependence or whatever. And, you know, I don't know. I think that there's something kind of, and I'm not like a, I saw unicorns. I, that was not my experience. <laughs> I actually think what happened for me with ayahuasca and why I think it's a helpful tool is, you know, I didn't hallucinate on ayahuasca. I kind of realized that I was hallucinating every day. <laughs> and on ayahuasca, I kind of saw things clearly. Mm. And I was able to take on a lot of the things that I thought were weaknesses from my dad as strengths. Yeah. And I was allowed to sort of accept the things in me that I got from him. And alchemize them into positives wow. you know it's like he was always working and too much and would you know I was like I was just trying to find ways to use what I thought were weaknesses of his and make them strengths wow. and accept the parts of him that were in me wow. you know I don't want to be like my dad I don't want to be like my mom that's all we say maybe they had good things about them yeah maybe we're just seeing them wrong or maybe we're just so wrapped up in our own judgment and blame that we can't see it mm -hmm. you know my dad had a very skeptical take on people. He mm -hmm. always called everyone liars, thieves, and worms, is what oh he would say. Gosh. And it's so negative, but I don't know. I, I, I found myself overcompensating the pendulum swinging too hard and trusting too much mm. and being... Going all in. All in, trusting everybody. Yeah, sure, I'll manage my money. Sure, I'll come stay at my house. Ooh. Sure, and I just, I didn't have enough of that sort of what I call like healthy skepticism yeah. and healthy boundaries. and a healthy sense of like seeing red flags, mm. you know? So I kind of, it helped me stop like divorcing myself from this story that my parents were so messed up and I, I want to be totally different than yeah. them. Do you feel like you do things to make your dad proud? Oh my God. Still? Oh God, I get, you're, you're so good at this. Um, I, when my dad passed, I had somewhat of an existential crisis because I realized so much of my engine was to try to impress him. Just and him? When mom he as well or just When him? he, I think more my dad. My mom, like, not so much. My mom was more like physical stuff, mm. like body, you know, appearance stuff that I've had to sort of work through. You got a great combo. It's a well, whole other thing. Yeah, real doozy, <laughs> real one, two. They were made for each other. Um, <laughs> You know, my and I realized when my dad passed, I did have felt like I was sort of in a free fall because I I was like, do I even want to do comedy? Like the wow. person that I was trying to impress is gone. Like I don't even know why I'm doing any of this. Wow. And I, I I canceled a bunch of projects I was doing. I checked out of a lot of things. I had to sort of completely revamp my priorities and figure out what I wanted. What's the priorities now? The priorities now are you know for me, I and this probably sounds gross, but I'm big on making money because mm -hmm. it is freedom. And yeah. I didn't have that growing up. So I do try to make decisions based on it being lucrative enough to be able to help a family member out mm -hmm. if they have an issue. You know, my family, a lot of my family members don't have health insurance and right. they didn't go to college. You know, so for me, it, it's I take a lot of pride in being able to earn mm -hmm. so that I can 
help people. You know, that just, I, I don't have cars and like yeah. that's not my thing. And shoes and horse. clearly clothes is not my <laughs> thing. I like to be able to, you know, give people um, the ability to sleep at night because they're not stressing out about money. Uh, you know, great. so I do make a lot of decisions based on earning. Yeah. And I spend so much time working for free, especially as a stand up. So, um, you're not making millions at the comedy store every Wednesday I really night. know that that fifteen dollars. The right, night you yeah. saw me, I made fifteen dollars. You know, so I work for free a lot because yeah. stand up is like bodybuilding. You're in the gym for yeah. a year making nothing, and then you get your special or whatever. So I definitely, once my dad died, I got a little more mercenary about the way that I spent my time because I worked for free for so long and continued to until my dad passed, and then just really high quality. Like, is this going to move the needle or not? You mm. know. And after that, the first thing I did was with was Roseanne, which did not end as planned. God, isn't that crazy? It was so big. Yeah. Like the launch and the show was so big. Yeah. And then one tweet ruins it all. I don't think it was one. I mean, there was other stuff. It, there was. Uh, I it found out. It seemed like one tweet was what it, 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 ruined thousands of people. Ostensibly, yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. It, it was one, the tweet that broke the camel's back, but there was definitely more her. before that I hadn't seen, and that was my mistake. Yeah, I didn't yeah. follow her before, and you know, like my dad said, ask people questions. I didn't ask enough questions, and I didn't do enough research, and sure. um, you know, but I did, you know, at the time, it was like, you know, we're gonna reach a bunch of people that we wouldn't reach normally, and, sure. I, and I think that Hollywood, we forget, we're in this echo chamber, it's and crazy. we are talking to such a small number of people, and this is an opportunity to talk to more people, you know, so I think that since my dad passed, I've just tried to be a little more big picture in the things that I take. I don't take jobs anymore to impress people. Mm. I don't take jobs anymore because there's a celebrity involved who might, this person might think is impressive. Like, right. I don't have those sticky motives anymore. It's like, do I want to do it or not? Wow. And the answer is usually, you know, no. Like, am I going to be proud of this? Am I going to get paid in pride? Mm. Is a big thing mm. for me now that my dad has passed. Because so paid used... and pride is the double combination. That's right. You know, if you get am I paid... proud of it? Am I paid by it? Oh, that's good. That's sort of the way that I I, I live now. Because it used to be like, oh, like, you know, whatever. I'm trying to think of a celebrity. So and so, Julie Roberts is a producer on this. I, I I'll be able to tell my dad that I'm working right. with Julie. Right? You and know, he'll love me more. Totally. Yeah. It used to be that stuff. You know, yeah. and um, it's kind of not like that anymore. It's like, would I do it for free? Right. Because you love it. But I wouldn't. But I want to make a lot of money there. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. And it's and it's. I just I know that it's gauche to say that, but I think no, it's important think it's, to know your value and to know your worth. I think financial freedom is a powerful thing. Having resources, you can serve mm -hmm. humanity in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. You can create the products you want, you create the life you want, you can help the people around you. So yeah. I don't think it's wrong if you know yourself. Yeah. But you're not buying it to freaking buy gaudy stuff and flashy. You're buying you're you wanna make shirt money. was forty five dollars. I love it. How dare this you? This is forty five as well. We're <laughs> the same say, person. That is We're a the, very like fancy it's a, shirt. It's just a blank T shirt, you know. Like know. A In LA black. those are like it's a big deal. It's like a what they call like a basic T, I think is what it's called. Forty five bus. It's not a V, so we're good. Um, I like these. You like a I, I feel like you're a, a deep V I, guy. Not a deep V. Just uh -huh. like a simple V. In like Turkey, a, you're going to have those no, V's. No, not down to hear like the nipples. <laughs> that, I mean, I do live in West Hollywood. There's lots of deep V's, but it's just like a little, just a little classic Yeah, a little v, you know, tiny, tiny V. Little, Slight suggestion yeah, of a V. Yeah. Just like a little, they have that just clavicle peeking yeah. out. A little, <laughs> a little flirting. <laughs> oh, hey. Oh, uh oh. Um, oh, yeah. So, so pri pride and pain. My, it's like my bar is higher and lower, you know, and the bar is changing. So for me, it's like, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, I'd be like, I'm not going to do a casino. Like, that's selling out. I don't have that anymore. It used to be like, you know, I was either, I was trying to impress people. I was so worried about like, if I post this ad on Instagram of me performing mm. at a casino, what are comics going to think? Like, yeah. I just don't have that anymore. Um, I don't have the same kind of shame around my choices. It's That's just, cool. I get to be a little more selfish like in it. a good way. I like it. A good kind of selfish. How do you deal with, um, how are you on time? Just to make sure. I'm fine. I'm I think like I'm fine. This. How are you, how do you deal with, um, I remember when I talked to Steve Aoki when I had him on, and I was like, what's one of your biggest fears or concerns? Something like that question. He said, being irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I see a lot of people in Hollywood who like, they get the special and then like next year, and then they don't get picked up again for the mm -hmm. next season. So they're hot and then it's just, they're chasing to be hot again. Yeah. There's so much excitement and expectation or hope that it's gonna work out. Mm -hmm. How do you face that because you had, you know, 
Two Broke Girls, huge hit. You had your own show, which mm -hmm. was like two or three seasons, mm -hmm. I think, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it didn't last as long as mm -hmm. the show you were creating. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that just aspect of Hollywood mm -hmm. in your career mm -hmm. of hot, maybe not as hot, yep. and then really hot, and then okay, Yeah, slow. the vicissitudes of the in and How out. How do you deal with that emotionally? Or yeah. And maybe you're better now because you're choosing things, you don't yeah. really care what's working in that yeah. way, but. I guess to me, I just, you know, I, I think you put something out when it's good and that's mm. how you stay relevant, you know? Wow. No, it's like, I just, and not, I, I agree with Steve and I, I feel that a lot too, but I also know feelings aren't facts and I mm. know what feelings are valid and which yeah. aren't. So it's like, to just put stuff out to stay in the zeitgeist is, I just, I personally don't know you know, a lot of comics, so you, it takes a year to put a good special together in order to make good mm. art. You know, you have to have a life and you have to make mistakes and you have to go out in the world, you know. So um, I found that when I was doing, you know, three shows and there, you know, it was this whole thing and everyone thought of me as this big success. It was, I was in a writer's room all day and I, I wasn't having a life and in order for art to imitate life, you have to have a life. And I didn't have one. Wow. And so I was limited in how good of an artist I could be. So now I believe you, you know, you make something and then you go off and you live more and you grow and then you come back and make something else and hopefully your work is actually evolving. If I just only kept putting things out, it would, I'd be putting the same thing out. How could yeah. I improve? So I just am a big fan of going away, growing, restoring, living, coming back and elevating. You know, mm. that's just my process. and. You know, and I also do lots of different things. So, yeah. you know, I'll go do a special, and then I'll do a show, and then I'll do a um, book, and then I'll, you know, I, I mm -hmm. I'm also a robot that it's not. I, out I yet. made a robot. <laughs> I just I don't care if people are interested in me. I I just want to be interested, you know. And what you're doing? Because otherwise, it's not going to be good. This is what I like. I feel like we're siblings or something because yeah. past life I twins do, or something I do a lot of things where my peers are like what are you, why are you doing that yeah like I wrote a book a year and a half ago about masculine vulnerability great it's called the mask of masculinity love it and everyone was like this is the worst business decision like you should do something else based on your last book and keep building upon mm -hmm. it and I was just like this is what's gonna be interesting to me yeah and what I feel like is needed right now in the world yeah that I'm proud of yeah and you work so hard yeah. and you're not allowed to do like I'm being on like, this one's for me and that one's for you yeah, right, and right, this, right. you know, this, I do that with jokes sometimes. It's like, there's a couple jokes where I'm like, <laughs> no one laughs. I know this never, <clears throat> no, this one's just for me. I like this yeah, one, yeah, yeah. you know, you, this is like a, you know, it gets like 70% of the reaction to the other ones. <laughs> but like, I like it, you know, yeah. I just, I think that, um, we're so afraid of being boring that we're boring ourselves. You know, oh. it's, it's, I, I just, I don't know how to put out authentic work if it's the engine is just to keep putting out work. Who's benefiting from that? Mm. I mean, there's just so much to choose from now and making something for the sake of making it. I'm always big on why. What's the why on this? Why am I going to give this thing a year of my life or whatever? And, you know, like making the movie, for example, that was just an experiment. We made it yeah. in 15 <clears throat> days for really? 15 not days. even a million dollars. Oh, it was like, I mean, you can, there's the coverage. It's like, you know, it was very... Um, post editing and everything else. Yeah. Totally. Figuring out in post <clears throat> and fixing it in post and, you know... Um, and wow. doing that weird little, I wanted to learn about neurology and I wanted to make a movie about- it was great, I loved it. I just was like, I wanted to make the thing that I wish it had existed and no one else was gonna Gosh. make a That's movie. That's what I always say, I'm creating what I would want. I want a movie about neurology that I wish when I was 23, there was someone explaining to me oxytocin and dopamine and sure. when you're in a relationship for a certain amount of time that you start producing less oxytocin and it's not personal and how cortisol works and how you know, organizing <clears throat> things reduces cortisol. That's why I'm so obsessed with how everything, you know, I just, right. for me, it would have, I would have saved so much time with taking things personally and over pathologizing myself, you wow. know, and other people. I'd have been like, he's not mad, that's just cortisol. I'm gonna right, give him right, a couple right. days for yeah. it to wear off and then we'll talk about it. You know, I guess I just, um, wanted that to exist and then as far as the book like this went I mean couldn't have been it came out the day of the Vegas shooting so there was some interesting that's cos interesting cosmic thing where it was you know the universe is going we're making sure you're doing this for you and for the right reasons right. you know because glory isn't always gonna be the reward and then I think when something comes out based on the success of it then you decide if it was worth it that's so unhealthy to me it should be like 
it's successful because I'm proud of the work I created. If one person yes. reads it or yes. a million people buy it, right? Yes. The reaction is the only thing that matters anymore. <clears throat> you know, and I found that I was chasing a reaction. Gosh, it's so true. Chasing a reception and chasing a feedback. And an applause. And an applause. That's exactly right. And so for me, I, I just want to be able to look back and, and be proud of the choices that I made instead of like I was just like on a hamster wheel trying to stay in people's timelines. Right. You know, and some of the people's career that I respect the most, they you can it's like when we were talking about relationships. You want to miss someone a little bit. You do. You know? I, I, I think that right now we're in Gosh. such like fatigue of people, you know, I just I think that I, I also experienced, you know, being ubiquitous and mm. having a sh you were everywhere and it didn't go great you know i'm i think i'm financially good. maybe it went okay it went great but i just it, i i'm good in small doses yeah. i also know that about myself because you had what you had like a you were a comedy tour you had the creator of two broke girls you had your own show whitney yeah i just was you like had like you know a bunch of stuff happening at once yeah and i just think that i don't know i think that artists um being ubiquitous is you don't want to over you what's know, your thoughts? On, what's your thoughts on someone like a Steve Harvey or Kevin Hart, who's all, all the place, everywhere, all the time? Those were <clears> such <throat> weird people to pair together. <laughs> what both you, comedians. Wait, right? <laughs> Steve Harvey and Kevin Hart. They're both comedians, right? Yeah, yeah. Ke I mean, Kevin Hart. I, I, you, that's. <clears throat> I think that he has, you know. What he has done is amazing, and he does it so brilliantly because, I mean, it's like he has, what, a movie come out a year, mm -hmm. and then... And a comedy special a year. Yeah, and but I'm not sick of him. I don't I don't know why. Yeah. I think he, he's just so endearing, and he's so charismatic, and maybe he, you know, is the exception to the rule, but right, I don't right. feel like a fatigue mm -hmm. on Kevin, you know? Because he's real and us authentic. He's not forcing, maybe. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why. I don't. I don't feel that. I'm not sure why. I think of Steve Harvey because he's got like multiple shows at once. Yeah. Just, oh God, does he? Yeah, he's got like Family Feud. He's got Steve Harvey show. He's I'm got behind some, on he's Steve Harvey. The, I don't know why. He had the kids show, like the kids celebrity show. Like mm -hmm. America's Got Talent for Kids or whatever. Right, 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 right. He had like three or four shows at once. Yeah, and a radio show and. Yeah, that's right. You're right. You're right. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, but you know, I, I, you know, I, I just can't think that way. I just uh -huh. to, in desperation to be relevant. I don't know. That feels like chasing. That just uh -huh. feels like a motive. That's. Um, you know, to me, I just try to be authentic and, and if I can and honest with myself and to just try to like keep up with everybody, which is what I used to do, frankly. I just didn't, it didn't yield the kind of work that I really feel, felt like I could be proud of. Like I'd rather just be mindful about it, figure out what I want to put out in the world mm. and put it out when it's ready. Mm. What's your biggest fear now then? I mean, being irrelevant is up there. I just know it's an <laughs> irrational fear, you know? Because yes. for me, the fear of being irrelevant you know, triggers codependency, yes. rush culture, <clears throat> something, yeah. get it out now instead of when it's right, <clears throat> this chasing, um, and then it doesn't get what you, the reception you want, and, and then, then you feel worse. Out. And that, you know, so um, my biggest fear now, you know, being boring is one that I struggle with. <clears throat> That's a big one. Podcasts are helping me with that because I'm just like, is this interesting to anyone? You've got it. I mean, you said the answer because <clears throat> I was always very insecure growing up because I didn't think I was interesting enough to mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And I would say stupid stuff that people would be like, you know, whatever. It happened two or three times that it stuck in my mind that yeah. like people didn't want me around. Yeah. Because you know, I was just stu stupid or ignorant or whatever it was. Just youngest kid. Yeah. And I, in high school and in college, I really shifted to just be like, I'm going to ask amazing questions and just listen. I'm yeah. not going to try to say anything. I'm going to do the opposite. And someone told me later, they were like, you do a really go good job of asking and listening. And You're the, mo amazing the most, in thank you. And he, and he said, the most interesting person is always the most interesting mm -hmm. person. Just what you said. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something why the podcast does well because I just want to ask questions. But you also ask questions that nobody <clears throat> else asks yeah. and you're very thoughtful and mindful about it. And, um, and you also ask it and then let the person answer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that go like, what scares you the most? Because what scares me the most? Uh, <laughs> and, and you're like, I'm, I, it, like, you know what I mean? It's you really are wait for the answer. Yeah. And it's... It's a practice though. It's actually jarring because I keep waiting for you to change <laughs> yeah, right. the subject. I'm like, oh, he's really... I really have to really answer curious, this. Yeah. It, I, I, it's actually kind of jarring. It's not a comedy podcast where everyone's interrupting each other. No. One up big... You're, I'm like, is someone <clears> going to do a bit or prank me? Or, you know, sure, you're sure. really... Um, 
you land, you stick the yeah, landing, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's, Wait. it's, a it's lot uncomfortable of, sometimes. You just, really are just, silence is a, is your tool of success. Like you ask the question and you wait for the answer, which is unbelievably. Um, well, it's called an interview for a reason. You know? I, I know, but it's, it's <laughs> jarring because I'm usually good at squirming out of things yeah. and not with you. But I think that that's a skill that I'm, I'm so happy for all your mm, listeners mm. because if people just did that on dates, it would save them five years in bad toxic relationships. If so you man. actually just asked a question and listened to their answer which is the advice my dad gave me that seems so simple. And not try to be interesting or try to tell the joke or all the time. have your reaction, the joke come in, you know, like mm -hmm. just to really listen and, and let people reveal themselves. And then once they do. People want to be heard and seen. And you, they will always, people always tell me, like, gosh, I don't even know what he said to me, but I talked to him for 20 minutes and he's just like the most, the yeah. coolest guy. Yeah. He's just such a nice guy. I don't even know what he said, but I want to help him. And I spent so much time trying to get love indiscriminately <clears throat> from mm. people whose love I had no business engaging with. You know, right. I spent so much time going like, I don't even know if you're the kind of quality of person I should be with, but I'm going to get your love regardless. And it yeah. was always like how to beguile people, how to charm people, how to get them to like you. Mm -hmm. And then you're stuck in this relationship with someone. You yeah. and you're like, oh God, why did I work so hard to get your approval? You're right. a nightmare. Right. You know, so for me, it's, um, I'm learning a lot from you because I, I don't do this enough in my hiring decisions. I don't get to mm. know people enough in my hiring decisions. Hire slow. And I... Fast. And I get to know their character defects and their song and dance. It's not easy. And I don't really ask mindful questions to find out what their character is. It's so hard as a as a, a business owner as well when you need to fill a spot because mm -hmm. you're you're doing too much of the work you don't want to do or mm -hmm. you're suffering in a, a situation mm -hmm. you want to put someone there quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's what you should you should wait. And I don't ask enough smart questions and listen to the answer. You should let other people interview them first. Hmm. On your team. Oh, that's good. I just brought on a new assistant. My other assistant had been with me for six years, and mm -hmm. she's transitioning to start a family. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had my assistant interview people first. Mm -hmm. Like they need to meet your requirements. Mm -hmm. Then, my, and then when she like found that. a few people that she liked, they go to my COO. He interviews them, mm -hmm. and you meet his standard. Wow. Am I gonna like this person? Yeah. Are they gonna fit into our culture? You know. What's and the biggest thing you look for in somebody? Uh, for me, it's attitude. I can't stand people that make excuses or mm -hmm. they don't have the willingness to figure it out. Yep. You know what I mean? I'm big on, you can make mistakes, you just have to admit you made one. Yeah. If you can't admit you made it, then we're in insanity. I wouldn't say... You I, can make a mistake a day if you want. Yeah. Like a huge you, mistake a day. Just don't do the same one over and over. Yeah, but if you... Do, <laughs> correct. Yeah, my bar is really low. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Um, no, but you, if you can't admit I was mm. wrong, I, it's like that's my biggest sort of bottom line and red flag with people. Yeah, exactly. So attitude, effort. Mm -hmm. For me, I was always I was never the best athlete, but I was always the MVP because of my effort. Huh. And my willingness to have like clear vision, mm -hmm. and I was willing to get up early, work out. And, you know, I never drank my whole life. Really. Never had a sip of alcohol in wow. high school, college. I was just like, I need a superpower, yep. and it's got to be effort mm -hmm. in my mindset. Love it. So effort, attitude, um, the desire and willingness to continue to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Someone who doesn't need to, be, uh, to hold their hand. But how would someone be able to construe that to you in an interview? I would tell them this. Oh, got it. I would say, this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know, I need effort. I need an attitude. So I would ask them questions like, what would you say? I don't know. I was just thinking of a question about, you know, if you made a big mistake mm -hmm. and I got upset, how would you react? Yeah. Or you knew you messed up, how would you respond? Mm -hmm. Just kind of feel it out. If they're like, uh, well. Interesting. They're but, like, I would own it, I would take responsibility, and mm -hmm. I would want to see how I could get better. I would want coaching. Yeah. Like, cool. I said traps. You set traps. That's healthy. I do. <laughs> and it's the same thing I learned in, in relationships, and this probably sounds like <laughs> manipulative. You have to sometimes, you know? It's, you got to test people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I this this your listeners might think that I'm off the, the grid on this, but I, I go like, what was it like at your last job? Yeah. And if they say negative things about their boss, exactly. I can't hire you. The same way if you're dating someone and you say, how did your last relationship end? And they say, well, she's crazy, or he was, she, it was like, I already know that yeah. you blame people. I think when you take ownership for everything in your life mm -hmm. and responsibility, that's when you're like, okay, I can trust this person. Yeah. Maybe they're going to mess up. Maybe mm -hmm. they're going to make mistakes, but they're going to own stuff and they're willing to grow. Yeah. And I that's think we have to really remember that we are wired to have a common enemy. It's something we bond over. Mm. And I think it's really important to know how we're wired and to just honor that. It's the same way, you know, people 
with dog breeds. They want to say, like, this dog was bred for this, but we can't... And then people go, breed doesn't matter. It all matters. You know, nature and nurture both matter. And I think it's important we just have to understand part of our nature sometimes. And when you're dating someone new and you both get to be mad at the person's ex, you're bonding over doing? something because that's what we're wired to something do. negative. Right. But it's then you go zoom out and it's like, oh no, that's a red flag. It's not healthy. And though it feels like we're connecting over something, a common enemy. I want to ask you a couple of final questions, okay. but I want to make sure people check out your book, I'm Fine and Other Lies. You guys can go get this book right now since it was such a big hit the day it dropped. <laughs> <laughs> so wild. Really funny stuff. But it powerful was, about anxiety, overcoming all the challenges you've gone through. It's about addiction. It's about codependence. Yeah. It's about eating disorders. It's mm -hmm. about freezing your eggs. It's about, you know, sort of a lot of um, sexual assault. It's about mm -hmm. sort of everything we all have dealt with. And it was interesting because <laughs> it, it, to come out the day of a tragedy, at least to go like, you're gonna have to wait two weeks to promote it and right. we have to relaunch it. Like all of, so much of the book is about not trying to control, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, and I have a new stand-up special. The, it's on Netflix, right? Yes, sir. The promos are, are hilarious. It's called Can I Touch It? <laughs> and it has a robot in it. Which I touched already. You did, you touched, wow. yep. I touched it. That's right. You it's gave called, me permission. It's called Can I Touch It Ask for, for many reasons. Yes. Because I talk a lot about all this sort of harassment stuff in the news and, you know, in comedy we're at this place where it's like, can I touch this? Can I talk about this? Can uh, we can talk I about say this? this? Can I say this? Can I, it's you know, sad. have this opinion? I feel like it's sad that comedians are getting shamed for so much. Mm -hmm. In some ways, maybe there's some crossing of lines, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, we're just so wound up. Like mm -hmm. everything is personal to people. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, there's a lot of self righteous indignation. And, you know, but comedy's always been a democracy. It's just that where people vote is changing. Yeah, so and you, have it, to, you have to evolve with it. Yeah. Otherwise, I think, they're not going to laugh and show up. Yeah, so it's like mm. funny's funny. And, you know, I don't think there's words that I don't think people, like, if you need to say that word so badly, how great is the joke? You know, I think that, you know, I, it depends, it's a case by case basis in terms of what I, think is ridiculous and what is like, well, do you really need to make a fat yeah, chick's joke? Yeah, it's not good. Is that not still, healthy. yeah, <laughs> I think it's like, we also, it's on us to not dig our heels in and it's on us to evolve. Everything yeah. evolves, everything changes. And, you know, um, there is a shift happening. I don't think that people yeah. should be silenced, but if you don't get a laugh, it- But I think it makes you be more creative. It's not because the audience is stupid. Mm, right, you know what I mean? Right. Well, you guys are laughing because you're PC. It's like, no, I always give the audience the benefit of the doubt. I mean, the audience is always right, uh, you know? And I think that because taste is changing and like what you just said, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, what's funny is changing, Yeah. you know? Because what we see in the news all the time, it's, it's so brutal that I think what people want to see on their night off is changing. Yeah. Because it used to be like, we make fun of the president and we say the things no one can say, like, we hear about that all day, every day now with Twitter and this, co we're constantly seeing negativity. That's true. All day in the news. That's true. You know, so I think what people want to see on their night off when they're paying 80 bucks is just changing. Yeah. And that's okay. It's 80 bucks to see you? Damn. Yeah, I mean, look. I'm in the wrong business. What. 80 bucks. <laughs> I, Rolling. Well, not when you saw me. No, that was. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think it's just to me and, and your listeners are obviously all about thriving and success yeah. and I just, it's, you got, you cannot stick to the thing that worked a year ago yeah. if it doesn't work anymore. In your it's, relationship, in your business, in life, yeah. How many times are you going to stub your toe on the table before you either move the table or go around the table? You know, so what can you change, what can't you change? And then go from there. I like it. You know? Because right now we're just going like, this thing, is the thing I did yeah. five years ago isn't working. Gotta it's evolve. like, yeah. Gotta grow. When's the special out? Uh, July 30th. July 30th. Yeah. Netflix. Uh, Netflix. Watch it, post it, share it on Instagram stories when you're watching it, tag you. It's going to be amazing. The trailers are incredible yeah. on your Instagram right now. Well, I actually have two final questions. Ooh. This one is called uh, The Three Truths. So I want to imagine that you are giving the last performance stand up of your life. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is watching. Just imagine. It's okay. a 50, 100 years from now, you still have all your um, capabilities of communication, mm -hmm. but it's you're like, all right, this is my last farewell tour. And eventually, you know, soon after you're gonna die, but you've created everything you wanna create, all the specials, books, mm -hmm. robots, whatever you wanna do. <laughs> 
in the future, right? Mm -hmm. But you have one last tour mm -hmm. and one last performance. Mm -hmm. And you do this amazing show. People are laughing, they're crying, they're enjoying, whatever you want it to be. Mm -hmm. But at the end, you get to leave people with three things you know to be true about your life and the lessons you would leave behind. Mm -hmm. It's what I like to call the three truths. Mm -hmm. That this is all people would have to kind of remember you by these three lessons. Mm -hmm. What would you say are yours? And I say them and they get, believe them. Like it works. Whatever I say works. You, you say it and this is your truth. This is like, you know, a lesson that's for me is like when I always live in gratitude, I live a better day. Like I want to, I want to leave that behind for you as like a truth, a lesson. Okay, okay. A lesson. If you've met more than two assholes in one day, maybe you're the asshole. I know it sounds like a quote. It sounds like a Never heard that ism. One. It's just like you have more power than you think in terms of, you know, maybe it's you. Because yeah. I think, you know, blame, is, blame yeah. is such a drug and, you know, and it's, it's tricky because we're seekers and we're people mm -hmm. that are constantly proving ourselves. But it really made me feel power, a power I didn't have when someone's mm -hmm. like, maybe it's, when something's your fault. At least I can do something about it. Yeah. There's something liberating in it right. being your fault. Sure. I love when things are my fault. I love when I'm wrong because at least I can fix it. You're when in control. Else, when someone else is wrong, there's nothing I can do. You know. <laughs> Yell at them. Totally. Shame them. There's nothing you can do. Manipulate them. You know. Scream at them, and then you're in insanity. You yeah. know. So I think that um. This is gonna sound like me being having an agenda and this is a quote there's people like 50 people have said it and nobody knows who actually said it or it's assigned like 50 people but i i do think we are so disconnected from the other species on our planet it just helps like the way we treat animals does is our legacy because animals are just what's have less power than us so the way we treat our animals is the way we treat our women the way we treat our children the way we treat anyone who's more it's how we teach the next generation to mm -hmm. abuse their power so I, like I think that that is something that you know just the way we treat our women children and animals is mm -hmm. who we are mm. ultimately i don't know why i don't know this comedy show is going to be awful. Uh, my last <laughs> show is going to be terrible. You've already made people laugh. Now I'm they, just want to hear, they just want to hear a message. Like, yet. I think it's, <clears throat> you know, mistreating people doesn't make you powerful. Mm, you know, okay. mistreating yeah. something with less power isn't yeah, I love power. The, I love the quote or the meme that's like, my father always taught me to treat the janitor that's the same as the CEO. Where it's like, always treat people with like equal kindness yeah the way you treat other people is a reflection of how you feel about yourself mm. you know and i think that when you disrespect other people you're just ruining your reputation you're hurting yourself you know and so i think that that's something that we don't understand or something that maybe there's a little bit of a um dissonance on yeah that you know the way you treat other people yeah. is very much a reflection of who you are and how you feel about yourself. Are you choosing to toxify your environment? Or are you choosing to purify mm -hmm. your environment? That's probably We don't forgive others because they <clears throat> deserve forgiveness. We deserve forgive others because we deserve peace. That's this a, is a good great one. truth. That's that a good might one. be the most powerful one. No one's ever said this. That's the best one. That, that is a banger. Is it's a banger. Resentment is a disease. Mm -hmm. It's correct. It crystallizes in it's your heart. Rat poison. And that, that you're right. drinking and mm -hmm. you're trying to give to someone else. Yes. And it just um, calcifies and you project it you all over the place. You create an, ener an energetic cancer in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like this one. I. This is so. <clears throat> This, this is a good one, and I don't think I'm going to phrase it eloquently first, but I do like it of just, and I'm sure someone said it in some way, but just that it's a big thing we say in program is just like, you're not your story. You're not the story you wrote about yourself. Boom. And. Or you can be a new, sorry, I interrupted you there. No, You please. can be a new story. Yeah. You can be the new story. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's right. You're not the old story, but you can create a new story. You cast yourself in the wrong movie. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's just, you know, and I think that like most of your thoughts are science fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other thing. Like a lot of your thoughts and beliefs just aren't true. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you're an idiot. That doesn't mean you're stupid. It's just that person's mad at me. That person doesn't like me. Like they're not thinking about you at no, all. They in don't fact, care. They don't they got their care. Own stuff. They're in their own insecurity. They're worried if you like them, they're obsessed about their selfie or, you yeah, know, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, we obsess about what other people think about us till we realize they're just not thinking about us at all. Um, good news, bad news. So I think that like, you know, a lot of our beliefs being science fiction is really helpful to me. 
um, a lot of the mm-hmm. things that I, I, I think that's, a lot of people don't like that because they're like, what do you mean? You're calling me dumb or, you know, it's just, yeah. it's no, that's a relief. A lot of the things that are in your head, the voices in your head aren't yours. Yeah, you can let go of it. Yeah. Um, they're voices that developed when you were a kid and under different circumstances. I really am glad we connected right in this moment in time. Really? Yeah, I wanted to interview you like months ago, mm-hmm. but you were too big time for me, I think. Or too, <laughs> too busy? Nah, I'm just kidding. I just, no, just it's busy. more, my thing is there's no point in rushing to do no, something. smart. Because I'm going to be distracted and, and... I'm excited. Well, it's perfect time because you got a show coming out. Everything's perfect. But I really am glad that i gotten to know you because I've just seen you on your show or special and at the comedy store once or twice. But getting to know your heart is really inspiring. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we connected right now in this moment in time. And I hope we get to do more stuff and I can support you in any way. Just let me know. If anything, look, your listeners, I have no idea what their, if they're, what their takeaway from this is. But I, if anything, it's like I'm not, I'm looking at your wall of all these people who like are experts at success and branding and I'm not I'm a if anything you I'm a big mess and I have success you can Mm. be a mess and have success you know like I'm looking at your wall and it's all these like overachieving like a plus like like incredible people um I make mistakes and I'm an addict and I had eating mm-hmm. disorders and I had a, you know, and I'm still do, I'm not, I have not fixed everything about me and I still have yeah. success, you it's know? Amazing. So maybe that's a good takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can just be a train wreck and still <laughs> have success. Live in the world. You don't have to be like you, like, you don't have to have read every single book. You don't have nah. to, like, you know, have be giving inspirational seminars in order yeah. to have success. That's great. You know, maybe that's a, imperfection is also okay. It's perfect. You know, God, this wall is really it's intense. <laughs> it's like all professional <laughs> healers. I know a lot. You know some of these healers. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of these people. Um, do it all. You uh, don't have to meditate every day to be a success. <laughs> I'm about to totally ruin. I'm about debunk to, it all. I'm about to debunk everything. You don't have to have rituals. You don't have to write in a yeah, journal. You I don't, don't have to do, wake up at five. You don't have to wake up at five. You don't have to work out. You don't have to be keto. Or paleo. Vegan? I don't even know what I'm saying. Like, you don't yeah, have to yeah, do yeah. any of that stuff. You don't have to take vitamins every... You can still be successful even if you're not... Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Doing all the things that... Life hacking. All the every, yeah, the, the, whatever. Yeah. You know. It's good. You can be a hot mess. I love it. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta come to your show. Do you do every week down here at the comedy store? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm there a couple nights a week. I gotta come more often then. Yeah. You've inspired me to want to come out more, so I'm gonna come out and bug you and... and and heckle at yeah, you. Sometimes and, I cancel, sometimes I flake, yeah. sometimes I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm imperfect. Perfect. Perfect. Like I'm, you know, flaming mess. I love it. <laughs> this, is my, <clears throat> this is my final question for you for this interview and hope I do more with you in the future. But Please. the final question is what's your definition of greatness? I really should have prepared for this. You know, I think it's greatness is like at least in what I do in my personal life, I, I don't even think I can really speak to that because I, I don't, you know, I, I think greatness in your personal life is more about your behavior instead of other people's behavior. Uh, you know, what you don't do instead of what you do do. Greatness is about shutting your mouth and not saying that thing or not giving that criticism or not losing your temper. Like greatness is, is more about being stoic. But I think for what I do for a living professionally, it's about making sure someone before they see you and after they see you they're changed in some way Mm. leaving some kind of impact like making Mm. them think differently see something differently laugh at something they never thought was funny it's at least with what i do you know the movie i made if you don't leave that movie knowing more about neurology than you did then i failed there's no greatness in that if you leave a comedy show that i did knowing less or not having tweaked your perception of something i failed there's no Mm. greatness there so i think it's like you know, greatness and and what I do is just leaving an imprint on somebody yeah. in some real way. That's powerful. You know, otherwise, what are you doing? You're just wasting so much time. I yes. think it's powerful. That's what we try to do here, and that's what I told you I wanted to do with this interview. I was like, I want people to leave better than this. That they feel inspired to make an impact. They want to 
take an action, think differently, mm -hmm. share with a friend, help someone. Because I, I just get a little bit, I get stuck in that, and sorry, now I'm rambling. Mm -hmm. I get a little bit stuck in the whole, like, mm -hmm. affect people, and because that sometimes goes into my codependence. It's not your job to fix people, or, right. you know, that's, or. Not fix, be, but. Yeah, it's their job to fix themselves. Like, greatness isn't, isn't martyrdom. You know, yeah. you don't go around and martyr yourself on people, rescue people emotionally, you know, care, yeah. caretake people. No. That because So that's when I get a little bit like, oh, wait a second. You know, greatness is staying in your lane and fixing yourself because you're, you know, the best way to, is to lead by example, you know. So that's why I'm kind of like yeah. tripping up on it's it. It's also like, what I'm hearing you say is like creating a piece of art through your work mm -hmm. that empowers people to think in a way to improve their life. Yeah, and have conversations they wouldn't have normally yeah. or change the way that they think for the yeah. better or, yeah. you know, change their mind about something. Or even if it's as simple as like, oh, women are funny. Oh, like I, even if it's that simple, even if I'm setting an example or a woman going like, oh, maybe I can do that thing I was scared yeah. of doing, yeah. you know? Um, I think leading by example is important. So I think greatness starts with, mm. you know, making yourself, instead of focusing on how can I help other people, like, well, get your shit together, right. and then we'll talk about what you can do for other people. But you're, sure. a, you know, you're a mess, yeah. cleaning up, cleaning up your mess, and then yeah. we'll talk about, you know. So I try to sort of stay in that space. Um, I also think there's just like a simple greatness, like would I make a better decision today than I would yesterday? I think mm. also there's that we get so, and you're such a like big picture. Mm -hmm healer mm -hmm. that I think sometimes there's this pressure to like do something so sure. sometimes greatness Brand, yeah. is like can be tiny and incremental absolutely and just like today I didn't text that person back that can be greatness because <laughs> sometimes that's the heart you know yeah or some small know. acts every single day are great yeah yeah, I think to me, Being I get nice, so smiling at someone on the street. That's why I'm getting that. so daunted because I'm like greatness, like oh shit, like this is such a big, you know. Yeah. I think greatness can be really tiny. This is why you know my definition used to be something like go be the best in the world of what mm -hmm. you need to do, but then it shifted to discover your, your unique talents, mm -hmm. pursue your dreams that mm -hmm. you enjoy, mm -hmm. and make an impact on people along the way. Yeah. While you're pursuing your, the thing you love. Yeah. For me, it's like. There's no one that's like be number one in the world and make a billion dollars or be so successful that everyone loves you. It's do the thing you love yeah. and help people along the way yeah. by being positive. Because so. it's, yeah, because it's, I think that like it's, we, we, I think always forget about the lead by example thing. It's yeah. like people like, can look to you and go, I might not have a podcast and be a brand like but, him, but I'm a teacher. Yeah, and if I course. just teach these five kids, you know, it's Impact like, these people. Yeah. 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 I like that. Like, what's your version of greatness? That's um, it. That's it. Yeah. God, these questions are I'm really stressing me out. I'm stressed. It's all good. Well, this is the last question, so I appreciate it. I, again, thank you for your heart. I just, I don't know, I just enjoy uh, the level of work that you've done on yourself and continue to do and acknowledging of it and processing constantly. I think it's rare to see someone in your position do this much work. Oh, wow. And talk about it openly and be like proud of it and not shaming yourself, so. Yeah, I just, I think we all like, I don't know, for me I like to lead with my failures and mistakes and flaws and, and because I think there's right now, there's just this perfectionism culture mm -hmm. and this brag about only your wins and don't talk about any of your losses mm -hmm. culture and I just, I think it's, it's yeah. just, it's no good, but I, I appreciate that you. Well, you're amazing. Say that. I appreciate you being here. Thanks. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Thank you.